handle difficulties in your life? What do you do when you feel pressure from all directions? How do you cope with the dark clouds of despair that surround you during times of trial and tribulation? Well, Peter, in his first epistle, deals with the issue of suffering. He points out that we need to come to him who is Christ as to a living stone. Peter then points to Isaiah's prophecy, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. In no other person does this principle become more true than in the person of David. During one of his greatest trials in life, he had to find his stability, strength, and security upon the rock of God. He tells us how he dealt with his problems in a psalm. So join us now as Dr. J. Vernon McGee looks at Psalm 62 and explains how this is the only psalm. Dr. McGee served as the pastor of the historic Church of the Open Door in downtown Los Angeles for 21 years, and it was during that time that he first gave this sermon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that those who are currently struggling with trials and tribulations in their lives will find renewed hope through today's sermon. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The only psalm. The message of the morning is taken from the hymn book the hymn book of the Bible. And the hymn book of the Bible is the book of Psalms. Each psalm apparently was set to music. Few of the psalms you will find have been repeated elsewhere in the Scripture. Psalm 18, for instance. There's a different arrangement in the book of Psalms, and obviously it was because in the book of Psalms it was set to music. The psalms were to be sung. They were to be played upon instruments. The 150th psalm reveals the fact that an entire orchestra was used for the singing of the psalms. Now, in case someone this morning feels that I'm going to sing this psalm, I want to allay your fears. I do not intend to sing. I do not intend to play upon any instrument at all. But Psalm 62 is a great hymn, and it's a majestic song. It bears a superscription, by the way, that's part of the Scripture. It's to the chief musician, and that lends importance to it. It wasn't just an ordinary song of David. When David composed this song, he sent it up to the head musician in order that he might present it at an appropriate time. And then we're told who this chief musician is, Jeduthun. He was one of the three leaders of the singers. He was the choir master of that day. The three sons of Aaron, their families contributed these three song leaders that served in turn in the temple. Now, David was responsible for the music in the temple. He himself was a gifted musician. He arranged the singers. He organized the choir and the great orchestra that played these great hymns that he composed. But I want to hasten to say this. The music of David was not a product of genius. uh, He was not a Stephen Foster. He was not a George Gershwin. After all, Stephen Foster never did have a Kentucky home, and he never did see the Suwannee River. But he had a flash of genius. But may I say to you, David didn't have just that. He didn't have a stroke of inspiration when he wrote these psalms. May I say this concerning them? The psalms are not sentimental ballads from Tin Pan Alley. They, none of them would ever be a jukebox favorite. You'd not find any of them making the hit parade. Uh, They wouldn't receive the platter panel award. Uh, These songs are not just a ditty with a catchy tune, not even a popular chorus with no real meaning but filled with saccharine sweetness. It's not a new arrangement of an old hymn. 
David wrote, my friend, out of a profound experience. David composed these out of deep feeling of his own life. Actually, the Psalms are the life of David set to music. Genuine they are. Abiding they are. The musical score was written in the blood of David. And Psalm 62 that we're considering today is a striking example of this. It's the expression of the heart of David at the time of the greatest crisis that ever came to this man's life. And in this psalm you see the soul of David laid bare. And you can look at David as you can look at David no other place. This man had a life that was filled with all kinds of mountaintop experiences. He was a shepherd boy, and as a shepherd boy he had wrestled with a bear and a lion. And I tell you, that's exciting. But this psalm is not about that experience at all. Then there was a day when he was called in from the sheepfold, and he was anointed king, and Samuel poured the anointing oil down over this red-headed boy's head. And that was a thrilling experience all the way from the pasture to the palace. My, what a story that is in the life of David. But this psalm doesn't happen to be about that at all. Then there was that experience of when he went out yonder as a boy with a slingshot against Goliath. But this psalm's not about that. Then there was that day when he sat with the harp yonder in the torch-lit palace of Saul, and Saul holding a javelin, and in a moment he let it go, and David, quick as a flash, went out the wind. Uh, that was an exciting experience, but this psalm's not about that. He spent years out yonder in the hills and dens of the earth, and he had, he had exciting experiences. Great crisis came to him there, but this psalm's not about that. Then there came the day when Saul and Jonathan both killed, same day, same battle, and that word was brought to David. I tell you, that was a great day, and he did compose a psalm, a funeral dirge, but this is not it. Then he committed that awful sin, that tragic sin in his life, that one sin in his life that stands out in such a glaring way, but this psalm is not about that at all. My beloved, Psalm 62 depicts none of these. This psalm tells of the greatest crisis of his life. He was an old man. His own son, his favorite son, the son that was more like him, than any other son, he was a spoiled brat, if you please. He led a rebellion against David. He stole the hearts of the people, and David, an old man, was forced to flee from Jerusalem, leave the comforts of his palace, and go back out yonder again to the dens of the earth. And you can see that old king fleeing Jerusalem. That's the crisis of this man's life. I turn back to the historical record for just a moment. Yonder in 2 Samuel 15, 30, I read this language, and David went up by the ascent of Mount Olivet and wept as he went up, and he had his head covered, and he went barefoot, and all the people that was with him covered every man his head, and they went up weeping as they went up. That was a tragic time in the life of David, this old king fleeing Jerusalem. It's the most dramatic moment in his life. It is the time of crisis. Shakespeare said there are times, or these are times that try men's souls. This is one of those, my beloved. David now is leaving Jerusalem. 
Absalom is marching in his own son, and men are having to make decisions. There are some that are having to choose David, and some are having to choose Absalom. It's a time, my friend, when David found out who was loyal to him and who was disloyal. He found out who his betrayers were, and he found out who his true followers were. He found out this man, Ahithophel, even related to him by marriage through Bathsheba. This man that was such an astute statesman, this man with such sagacity and wonderful ability, this man that David had leaned upon, word came to him that he had deserted and gone over to Absalom. And this was the first Alger hiss on record, my beloved, and it broke the heart of David when he found out this trusty man had deserted him. Then Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, came and said that Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, had betrayed him, but he couldn't believe Ziba. Ziba was two-faced, and David never knew which face to believe. And so he wasn't quite sure about this man Mephibosheth at this time. And then Shimei stood on the outside of the city of Jerusalem, that man who was a member of the house of Saul and hated David. He threw stones at David. He cursed David as he went out. Then David goes out barefoot. He goes out crying. Absalom enters Jerusalem in triumph, and the same crowd that had shouted to the rafters for David are now shouting for Absalom. And a little later on, their children shouted when that man, the Lord Jesus Christ, came in one day, they said, Hosanna. The next day, they said, Crucify him. David knew about that sort of thing, my beloved. And Psalm 62 is the song of David in that moment of anxiety, in that hour of defeat, in that day of darkness, in that time of testing. And as I read this psalm, I'm amazed. There is not one note of discouragement. There is not a scintilla or suggestion of fear. There is not one word of distress. There is no sound of alarm. There is not even a breath of retreat. There is no rancor or bitterness welling up in the heart of David at all. In fact, many that have read this psalm, they say, well, we can't understand. How could David write a psalm like that out of such an experience like that? This is a psalm of salvation. This is a pean of praise. This is an opus of optimism. It's a song of sanguinity. It's a thesis of trust. It is a work of wonder, my beloved. May I say this is a soprano solo and the hallelujah chorus all wrapped into one. Here is a man who has committed his way to God. This is a man that's traveling in the spiritual stratosphere. Here is a man that's living above the storms and shocks and stresses of this life. And this morning, may I say from here on, you might as well go home. Those of you tuned in might as well tune out. I'm going to preach to myself from here on. I'm talking to myself now, not to you this morning. I want to get up and live where David lived. I want to be the man that David was. I want to live in dependence as David lived upon Almighty God as this psalm reveals it. Will you note with me the mechanics of this psalm very briefly? We don't want to be tedious, but it's important if you're to understand it. This little word, Selah, 
occurs twice in the psalm. If you notice, I did not read it. You should not read Selah when you read the psalms. It's actually a, some kind of punctuation. It's sort of like reading and coming to the end of the sentence and saying, period. It means he got to the end of this thought. Some think it means a, a stop, look, and listen sign that you see at a railroad crossing. I have a notion it's all that. It occurs three times in this psalm, in verse 4 and in verse 8. It ends both verses. And therefore, it divides this psalm into three stanzas. And each stanza opens with the little adverb, only. I wonder if you've noticed that. However, our translation doesn't give it, and that's the reason I read this morning from the American Revised. Only upon God my soul waiteth in silence. That's the way it opens. And then the verse 5 that we have the second stanza, it says, My soul wait thou only upon God. Then verse 9, the third stanza, only men of low degree are vanity. And actually, the little word only occurs three other times in this psalm. I think it was Spurgeon who was the first to call this the only psalm. That doesn't mean there are not 149 other psalms. There are. It means that this is the only psalm because it emphasizes the little word only, only upon God does my soul rest. My beloved, I want you to notice this. These three stanzas divide like this. You have in the first stanza, verses 1 to 4, the test of faith. Verses 5 to 8, you have the time of faith. And then verses 9 to 12, the triumph of faith. And will you note with me these three stanzas? First is the test of faith. And he sets the pattern in this opening statement. I've often thought that a solo voice way off yonder in the temple somewhere opened this psalm after a tremendous overture by the orchestra. Upon God only my soul waits in silence. Now I see the deep conviction which motivated the life of David. I see now the currents which swept over his spirit, guiding and directing him through life. I see David's heart now put under the X-ray. I see now his soul laid bare. I see David now for the first time. My beloved, you don't see him in the historical books. You can see him here. His son is in rebellion. That's an awful thing to have a son in rebellion against you. What an experience this was for David to have his favorite son, a son he loved above every other son, to be in rebellion against him, actually seeking his life. And then David saw his enemies come to the front. He saw his enemies moving out to lay hold of him in order to destroy him. He saw some of his friends turn traitors. And David was forced to flee. He didn't defend Jerusalem, his beloved city, he didn't want a battle within the walls of that city. And so he left and went back out yonder to the caves of the earth. Fate had dealt him a cruel blow. Weaker men have crumbled and have folded up under circumstances that are not as trying as this, my beloved. But I look now at David. There's no complaint, no cry. No condemnation, no criticism. He's so committed to God. He's so cast upon God. There's nothing to say. There's no defense he has to offer. He says, my way is cast into the hands of God. 
My life is in his hands, and if he's permitted this to come to me, I don't know the outcome. I'm not so much concerned about the outcome. I'm concerned about staying in the hand of God. And so David quietly, without, without uttering any word whatsoever, David moves into these circumstances unmoved, undisturbed by these things that are taking place around him. I have a notion, I don't know this, but I think there must have been some hot-headed follower of David that said to him, why don't you stay and defend Jerusalem? Show the people that you're still the hero that you were at the beginning. It's cowardly to leave. You ought to stay here in Jerusalem, but not David. David says, my hand's in the life of God. Seems best to leave, and I'll leave. I'll not, I'll not dare. I'll not test. I'll not be audacious. I'll move out at this time. I have a notion that there was some foul fanatic there, generally is, demanding of David that he show his faith, that he command God to save him. Isn't he God's anointed? Then God must heal him, and God must do this. My beloved, David doesn't live on that low plane. Just believe it hard enough and it'll make it so. David didn't have that shallow kind of faith, my beloved. Here is a man living above the hue and cry of little men. He's not stampeded by spiritual snobs. He'll not listen to pious shibboleths. David is in the hands of God, my beloved. And little men will have to see a miracle, but not David. He'll walk in the dark with God, my beloved. Oh, what faith that is. What a God-given faith that is, my beloved. What others call defeat to him was just a test of faith. David can retreat from Jerusalem, and it's still going to sound like a victory, my beloved. And will you listen to him now in this glorious psalm? He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. And I see Zadok, the high priest, coming out to go with David. He was faithful. And he brought the ark out and started to follow David out of Jerusalem. And David turned and listened to him now. I can see the heart of David for the first time as I go back to Second Samuel and pick this up in the historical book. And the king said unto Zadok, Carry back the ark of God into the city. If I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he'll bring me again and show me both it and his habitation. But if he thus say, I have no delight in thee, behold, here am I. Let him do to me as seemeth good unto him. Here is a man. Oh, friend, I wish this morning I could make this clear. I wish this morning I could get you to see this great truth. Here is a man so committed to God that when the ark is brought out, and on other occasions they brought it out to battle, that's the way they lost it to the Philistines, because they thought there was some merit in it, some superstition connected with that ark. David didn't live on that kind of plane. He knew that there was no merit in that box. He said to Zadok, take it back to the city, Zadok. If it's God's will for me to come back to this city, I'll come back. If it's not God's will for me to come back, then I'm in the hands of God. Oh, friend, to live like that today. Not attempting to force God to do anything, but to go the way that God leads, regardless of which way he might lead. Then will you listen to this next verse? How long will ye imagine mischief against a man? 
ye shall be slain all of you. And what David really means here is a bowing wall shall ye be and as a tottering fence. He means that you are running over me as if I was just a tottering fence. You, you're just coming over me and running over me. And he's thinking of these. There has been this man, Ziba, servant of Mephibosheth, who did a dastardly thing and thought he'd gain favor with David. And he said his master had deserted, which was not true. And then there's the story of Ahithophel. It's a heartbreak. May I say to you that Ahithophel is the one David is speaking about in the psalm that's prophetic of Judas Iscariot. Ahithophel was like Judas Iscariot. He was one of the inner circle of David. He was his best friend. He's the man that he leaned upon. He was the wisest of his counselors. And then Ahithophel went over to the other side. And David, in that dark hour, though that took place, he said, you're running over me, just like you, a mob runs over a fence. But that's all right if that's God's will. And if this thing's come to me, I'm going to accept it like that. Will you listen to him? They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. There was that fellow Shimei out yonder on the outside of Jerusalem and in the heyday of David's reign when he went out. Shimei bowed like the rest of them. But there came a day when the rebellion came and old Shimei, traitor that he was, waiting for the day, biding his time. When David went out of the city, he cast rocks at him. He cursed David, and he said, You bloody man, you! And David had a loyal captain by the name of Abishai, the son of Zeruah, and he said unto the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. Abishai said, Let me get rid of him. Let me take things in my own hands. And my friend, if you want an example of what the Scripture means by vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Listen to David now. The king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruah? So let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David, who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? Why, God's permitted him to curse me. You let him curse me. Have you ever stopped to think, my friend, that God has given you certain enemies for a certain purpose to test you, to make you a better Christian? And today we become so alarmed at the enemies that are round about us and, and the difficulties that God puts in our way, and we think that he's being hard upon us. Oh, to reach the place where we can trust God, my beloved, to the extent we don't cry out at a time like that. You see what I mean when I say this morning, I'm preaching to myself. Will you notice the second stanza? It's the time of faith. And the time of faith is the entire life of any man. The moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you're saved. We emphasize this. It's an important moment. But I think that we're neglecting today the life of faith. We today are not majoring on our birthday. We say we were born on a certain day, but believe me, you've been living ever since. And every moment ever since has been very important. It's one thing to be born, my beloved. It's another thing to live. And it's the life of faith that counts. And that's the thing that David is talking about here, the time of faith. When is the time of faith? On the sunshiny day? When it's not raining? Is it time to trust God when things are going right? Well, David says that the best time to trust God is at the crisis moment in your life. And will you listen to him now? 
My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. This is a Bible definition of prayer. I remember several years ago that Mildred Livingston, one of our missionaries down in Venezuela, sent me in a letter. She sent back a little card. I'd never seen this before, and I've re retained it ever since because it, it seemed to be rather important, and it was this. True prayer is the Holy Spirit speaking in the believer through the Son to the Father. That's prayer. That's real prayer. My expectation is from him. David is saying here, I'm not making some wild prayer. I'm not making some audacious statement. I'm not demanding that God do anything. My expectation is from him, and I expect him to put into my heart the thing that he wants done. I want him to have me pray for the thing that's the best thing to be done, my beloved. Here is a man that has not just a prayer meeting, and by the way, I should say that there was another person, I'm sure, around David, a very pious individual that said, David, the thing to do is to have a prayer meeting. You are in such a terrible condition, let's have a prayer meeting. I think David had said, what do you think I've been doing? My entire life is a life of prayer. My expectation is from him. Listen, my beloved, here is the example and the illustration of what Paul meant when he said, pray without ceasing. Paul didn't mean for you to get on your knees and stay there 24 hours a day. Paul meant for you to get on your knees and pray, and then, my beloved, live in the expectation of that prayer 24 hours every day. It's to live a prayer life. It's to live this thing. And David is not calling a prayer meeting. In fact, the amazing thing about this psalm, it was the first thing that impressed me was this, there's no prayer in it at all. And then I found out that the entire, the entire psalm is in the atmosphere of prayer, my beloved. Here is a man so committed to God that his life and his actions are that a prayer? And I see that old man going out of Jerusalem. I hear him weeping, but now I see his heart, a heart of a man that's committed to God, and he'll go with God regardless of what the outcome might be. Other men would have become bitter, but not this man. And now he's saying here uh, something that's tremendous. My soul, wait thou only upon God. My expectation is from him. He only is my rock, my salvation. He's my defense. I shall not be moved. That's the central truth of the psalm. That's the central truth of David's life. There is the dynamo that ran this man. That's the thing that made him light up. That's the thing that caused him to stand head and shoulders on the horizon of history above other men. That's caused him to cast a long shadow down through this world. Why? Because he could say, He only is my rock. He's my rock. Now when I come to the New Testament, I see now what the Lord Jesus means when he says, and he says something that's very tremendous, my beloved, whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it'll grind him to powder. Christ is that rock. Christ is that stone. There's coming a day when the stone cut out without hands will fall on this earth. But today, you and I can fall on this stone, and those that fall on this stone will be saved. A little Scotch woman got up in a testimony meeting, and she gave this as her testimony. She says, you know, sometimes 
I tremble on the rock, but the rock never trembles under me. My beloved, this morning are you on the rock. Whosoever falls on this rock, he'll be broken. He'll be saved. But on whomsoever this stone shall fall, it'll grind him to powder. This is what Paul meant when he said that no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. David said, he only is my rock. He's the one I'm resting on. He's the one I'm trusting. Oh, the throne is toppling. Jerusalem is in convulsions and the people have turned against me. But I'm on the rock. Hallelujah. I'm on the rock. Friend, this morning, where are you? An earthquake may shake Southern California. But if you're on a certain rock, you won't be shaken in Southern California. Oh, my beloved, this man had learned that tremendous lesson. Now, briefly, will you notice the triumph of faith? He could say now in verse 9, listen to him, Surely men of low degree are vanity and men of high degree are a lie. He says, I've learned you can't trust the mob. I've learned that the crowd can't be, can't be expected to go along all the time. They're fickle. I found out that men of high degree, my counselor Ahithophel, they're not to be trusted. And these men that I've more or less leaned upon, I've discovered I can't lean upon them. And this is the first thing that a new Christian needs to learn, is not to look to man, but to look to God. That's the thing that causes many new Christians to become discouraged today and disappointed and disillusioned. They get their eyes on a man. That's what a young Christian said to me the other day. He said, you know, Dr. McGee, I got my eyes on a man. And he says, I tell you, it almost made shipwreck of, of my faith. David says, I got my eyes off of man. I knew all the time I couldn't trust these and so my faith was fixed firmly upon God. I found out that I was resting on a rock that could not be moved at all. And then he says that I couldn't trust material things either. And many trust those. Trust not in oppression. Become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. And then David heard the conclusion. And the conclusion was this. Will you listen to it now? Why is it that you can trust God? God hath spoken once. Twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. My friend, this morning you can trust God because God can do anything that requires power. He has all power today. God today can do anything that he wants to do. We have a God this morning that can do anything he wants to do. Now, I have a notion that many said to David, David, look what's happening to you. David says it doesn't make any difference. Power belongs unto God. It never did reside in David. I was a great king, but God made me a great king, and now he's permitted me to leave. And if it's not his will for me to come back, I'll not come back. But I do know this is true. Power belongs to God. But you know, friends, power is the most dangerous thing there is in this world today, and yet that's what all of us wants, power. Every servant today wants more power. That's what's happened in Russia today. The rulers of Russia were peasant men who wanted to rule. That's one of the things, as some statesman said recently, that's the thing that's wrong with the world today. There are too many people who want power. Power is the most dangerous thing in the world today, and right now the world's in fear and dread because man has made a little bomb that contains power, and it's the most dangerous thing in the universe today is power. 
And so David said, I heard something else that goes with power. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy. And my friend, if you have power, you ought to be able to exercise mercy. And David is saying here, David is saying that my God who can exercise power is a God that can also exercise mercy. He said yonder to Zadok, take the mercy seat back, put it back in the temple. I'll find mercy with God. At the very heart of this Old Testament religion was that mercy seat. And my friend today, at the heart of the Christian faith today, there is mercy. Come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord. I think that's what Brother George Bernard meant when he said, I'll cling to the old rugged cross. Mercy, my beloved, mercy. Maybe I haven't preached to you today, but may I say, I wish, I wish that Vernon McGee could live on that plane where David lived. He only is my rock, my salvation, my high tower. I shall not be greatly moved. Are you standing on the rock of salvation? Have you experienced the mercy and grace of God that He offers through His Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to free you from your sins? Well, if you have some questions about salvation, or if you'd just like more information, then we'd like to send you our salvation packet. To receive yours, just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. You can do it any time. And when you call, be sure to leave your voicemail request for the salvation packet along with your name, address, and the call letters of this station. Now, today's sermon, The Only Psalm, is available on an individual CD. You can also find the text of this sermon as a chapter in Dr. McGee's hardback book, David, A Man After God's Own Heart. This wonderful book also includes sermons on the key events in David's life, including David the Giant Killer, Water from the Well of Bethlehem, and Doing the Right Thing the Wrong Way. We believe this 223-page book will be a heartwarming, inspiring, and challenging book. So consider getting a copy for yourself or possibly one for a friend or a loved one. To receive ordering information on either of these items, contact one of our service operators at 1-800-65-BIBLE, Monday through Thursday, from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific Time, or shop our online bookstore anytime at ttb.org. Be sure to join us this week on the Through the Bible radio program as we continue Dr. McGee's study in the book of Psalms. If you'd like to be added to the mailing list for our newsletter and notes and outlines, you can do so when you call 1-800-65-BIBLE anytime. You can also use our Internet order form or download them from our website at ttb.org. Or write to Sunday Sermon in the U.S. Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. This is Steve Schwetz for all of us at Through the Bible, reminding you that we pray that our God will fill you with His grace, mercy, and peace. This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of Through the Bible Radio Network.